Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Hi, my name is Casey Luskin, and welcome to the ID the Future podcast being broadcast from the Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. We have a very special podcast today as we have biochemist Michael Behe right here in the studio with us. Michael, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Casey. It's good to be with you. Okay. Well, what we want to talk about today is some recent claims from Darwinists that the flagellum could possibly evolve. And I'd like to first um, ask you, uh, Dr. Behe, can you explain to our listeners what is a flagellum and why are they important to bacteria? Well, a flagellum is a tiny molecular machine which is quite literally an outboard motor that some bacteria use to swim. Uh, it's on uh, their membrane and it has a propeller and it, it motors them about so that they can find food, find each other, and, and so on. Okay, and in your view, uh, what makes the flagellum irreducibly complex, as you described it in your book, Darwin's Black Box? Well, it is irreducibly complex because it needs a number of parts in, in order to work as, a, as an outboard motor. It needs the propeller, it needs a motor, it needs to be fastened onto the membrane of the, of the bacterium. Just like a, an outboard motor in our everyday world needs a propeller and a motor and a whole list of different parts in order to work. Dr. Behe, you wrote in Darwin's Black Box that you had a tough time finding papers which discuss the evolution of some biological systems. And an article was actually recently published in Nature Review's Microbiology, which says that, quote, the flagella research community has scarcely begun to consider how these systems have evolved, unquote. How does this statement in this Nature Review's Microbiology paper jive with your earlier comments in Darwin's Black Box? Well, it fits in, in really well. It, it just confirms my judgment that Darwinism is a very poor framework in which to think about how things, uh, complex molecular machinery like the flagellum might have come about. Here it is 10 years down the road since I first wrote about this, and the argument has gotten a lot of publicity and a lot of uh, scientific organizations have taken it as a challenge, and yet here we are a decade later and there's still no answer as to how random mutation and natural selection could put such a thing together. So we know that your arguments are wrong, but the flagella research community has scarcely begun to consider how these systems evolved, right? Is that yeah. pretty much the state of things? Okay. Answer first, evidence later. Yes, okay. Well, actually, the article, to give credit to the article, it does try to make a few arguments uh, which the authors think suggest that the flagellum could evolve. And I'd like to go over two of those arguments with you here and discuss them a little bit. Um, would that be okay? Sure. Okay. So firstly, the article claims that the flagellum may be descended from some kind of a secretion system, like what they call the type 3 secretion system. And you've heard this argument before, and I'd like to know, what do you think of this argument, and how do you, do you feel that it solves the Darwinian problem here? No, I, I think, <laughs> ever since I, I first heard it, I, I've been scratching my head trying to see what Darwinists see in this. It's been discovered that the flagellum is more complex than anyone knew at the start, uh, that it not only can act as an outboard motor, it can, it can function as a complex protein pump. And yet, the more unreflective Darwinists have, have somehow uh, seen this as an improvement. It's kind of like saying, well, my car looks irreducibly complex because it's got wheels and it's got a, a steering wheel and it's got brakes. Then somebody opens up the hood and says, why, well, look, here's a fuel pump. You know, we could have used that fuel pump for something else. That means that your car could have arisen by random mutation and, and natural selection. The fact that other parts of the flagellum can be used for other purposes says nothing about how the function of being mm. a rotary motor might have developed. Mm. That's a great point, Dr. Behe. Now, another argument the article makes is that it tries to list as many homologous proteins as it can for various flagellar parts. And first, could you tell us a little bit, what does it mean to say that a gene is homologous? And also, do you find uh, mere citations of protein homology to be convincing as e evolutionary explanations? Well, uh, take, to take the first question, a protein is thought to be homologous if it's thought to be related by common descent from the gene for a separate protein. And scientists usually uh, make this judgment if they see that two proteins have 
at least some portions of their amino acid sequence in common, even though some other portions might differ. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Casey, what was that, what was that second question? Sure. So, so well, maybe we just go with that train of thought for a second. So basically the argument is that if the genes are similar, then therefore they must be related through some sort of common ancestry of, of the genes. Is that the yeah, argument, that's, basically? That's, that's it. That's the assumption. Okay. Okay, so I guess the, the follow-up then is, do you find these citations of protein homology, which really, as you said, are, are just comparisons of protein similarity, do you find these to be convincing as evolutionary explanations? Uh, no, not at all. And I, I wrote about that 10 years ago in, in Darwin's Black Box. You have to realize that we're not discussing whether things are similar. We're not discussing common interest, ancestry. When we talk about intelligent design, we're asking the question of whether random processes could put something together or whether intelligence was required. Uh, in Darwin's Black Box, I, I uh, cited several examples of proteins that have sequence similarities, but it is not at all clear how one could turn into another or a multi-part system come about from uh, such proteins by a random uh, process, step by step. So, and Dr. Yehi, when I was looking at this article, I couldn't help but notice that at the list of the various parts of the flagellum that they list, I think that article actually tries to list a large number of the known parts of the flagellum. 11 of the 38 parts they listed had unknown homologies, and 20 of the parts were, quote, indispensable to flagellar function. So how does this fit with your ideas? Well, it fits pretty well. Uh, if uh, an irreducibly complex system, you can't get rid of the parts or it loses function. And if a large number of the parts of the flagellum are, in their words, indispensable, well, that kind of goes pretty well with the concept of irreducible complexity. The fact that 11 of the proteins do not have uh, sequence homology to other proteins, uh, in my view, it really is neither here nor there. And if they had homology with other proteins, it still wouldn't say anything mm. uh, whether they could develop by Darwinian processes. The fact that they don't, I guess, makes it even tougher for, for hardcore Darwinists to to try to explain uh, such a machine. So, I mean, obviously, the, the point of this article, it did have an upbeat point, although it acknowledged, you know, a lack of research in this area, it said that we need to do more research. And, and the point of the article is basically encouraging evolutionary biologists and microbiologists to do research into how these systems evolved. So would you encourage an evolutionist who thought, you know what, I think I can come up with an answer here. Would you say, all right, go for it. Would you encourage them to go and try to at least do this research and how these systems might have evolved? Oh, I'd be del delighted uh, if, you know, the budget for such things were a thousand times greater than it is. I think the more research that's done into the question of what random mutation and natural selection can do, the more and more Darwinian theory is, is seen to be inadequate. So I'm, I'm very strongly in favor of more research. So this is probably a rhetorical question, but what, what do you think will be the outcome 10 years from now when they revisit upon this paper? Where do you think will be? Or, or do you want to make a prediction? Uh, yeah, I'll make a prediction that some brave soul will try to figure something out and get discouraged after a few experiments, and then 10 years down the line, uh, we'll be pretty much uh, in the same uh, situation. Maybe some of those, those non-homologous proteins, one or two, will be found to have homology to something, but uh, we will not be anywhere near understanding how such uh, things could be produced by random processes. But still, just to even do the research, to try to do it, and to maybe learn that Darwinian explanations are not the answer, that would still be progress for science. It would be progress if scientists are willing to take no for an answer. Mm, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Behe, for being with us today. This was a great, uh, real honor to have you here in the studio, and I appreciate all the great work you're doing. Thanks. It was, it was fun. Okay. Well, this is Casey Luskin with the ID of the Future podcast, being broadcast from the Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington, signing off. Thanks for listening. Music on ID the Future comes courtesy of composer Yuri Momchur. Visit www.yuriproductions.com and check out his latest CD, In the Harbor. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. Discovery president is Bruce Chapman. ID the Future managing editor is Robert Crowther. And the producer is Keith Bennett. ID the Future and ID Science in the News is copyright Discovery Institute 2006. For more information, visit www.discovery.org or www.idthefuture.com.